Hello, uh, welcome to this session, Sharing Existing Practices Against Disinformation, EPAD. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, okay, my name is Daisuke Furuta, uh, the moderator of this session and editor-in-chief of Japan Fact Check Center. At the G7 ministerial meeting held in April, it was decided each country's effort regarding countermeasures against disinformation will be shared and presented at the IGF here. So this session is the result of that meeting. I will explain the EPAD compilation, not only that, but today we have amazing panelists here for, and online for this session. Adivoro Sasmit from Mafindo in Asia. Chai Hofelina from Rappler, Philippines, Madeleine Shepherd from Microsoft, and Shinichi Yamaguchi, Glocom from Japan. I will ask each of you to introduce how you work on uh, countermeasures against disinformation. Okay, so let's start. First, I would like to share the EPAD. <coughs> okay, um, G7 countries and the EU are pre <coughs> practicing many measures, so not all of them can be presented today. So please use this QR code to see the list of all measures. The measures can be divided into four categories, civil society, social media platforms, research entities, and government. Today, I will introduce only those unique measures. Oh, I will show uh, the QR code later again, so don't worry. Um, um, first, uh, about civil society. Uh, from Germany, they support projects such as the European Statistics Contest for Young Students and a webinar on common mistakes in dealing with statistics for journalists. Um, this is unique, uh, statistics training for journalists. Uh, you know, um, many journalists, including me, are not very good at numbers, so... Yeah, it's really useful. And then from UK, for media literacy education, they developed resources and projects to help build resilience to misinformation. For example, Be Internet Citizens by Institute for Strategic Dialogue, Fake News and Misinformation Advice Hub, and Find the Fake Game by Internet Matters. And media literacy education is, of course, essential to prevent sharing uh, this information. And from Japan, Japan Fact Check Center, yeah, it's my own organization, JFC, was established. Now we are a signatory of the International Fact Checking Network, so each country needs its own fact check organization. And about social media platform, the social media platform are such a big part of this issue, and so many countries have been introducing some measures. I think this is a significant change during these years. Uh, from the UK, promoting reliable information in search functions. For example, uh, direct, direct users toward gov.uk or electoral commission in the lead up to elections. And from EU, Improving large platforms' accountability through the Digital Service Act, DSA. And from France, strengthen the accountability of platforms by requiring them to analyze the systemic, systemic risk generated by the operation of their services on the missing information. And then research entities uh, from Canada know it or not. This is a tool for education made by Digital Public Square. It's a project by University of Toronto and Media Smarts, it's NPO. And from Germany, integration of topic of official statistics in baccalaureate and master programs. And from Japan, they released videos to raise awareness of anti-fake news in April along with the G7 related event, Fake News and Japan. And from government, uh, EU, regulatory or co-regulatory measures to ensure transparency and platform accountability, uh, code of practice of info disinformation, digital service acts. And from US, developed official digital communication channels that ensure credible fact-based information is publicly available. 
and from Italy, AG Shiyome, uh, AG Com. Communications Regulatory Authority established a working group aimed at fostering pluralism and freedom of information also on digital platforms. Okay, so yeah, that's just a brief summary of EPAD. So please jump to this QR code I mentioned earlier for a list of all measures. The list includes a variety of initiatives by multi-stakeholders such as government, platforms, civil society, and research institutions. Okay, um, I will now ask each of you to the presenters, the speakers, to share what your own organization is doing to ensure a healthy information space. So first, Ali. This one is on, thanks. So, uh, good afternoon, Kyoto Japan time, and good day, good morning, good evening to whatever time zone you are right now, for those who is joining online. Uh, my slides, please. So, for this occasion, I'd like to first thank the MIC for inviting me to be able to attend to this such, uh, such important event. So, what I would like to present, uh, since it's going to be just a few minutes, uh, I'm going to present, present just the highlight. So my, my, the title of my presentation would be the highlight of Mafindo's role in today's information ecosystem. So um, Mafindo, we are established officially in November 19, 2016. Uh, Mafindo stands for Masyarakat Antifita Indonesia or the Indonesian anti host community. We are a non-profit organization, mainly fighting disinformation and providing literacy education. Uh, at the moment, um, sorry, the, the, the writing is a little bit small from here. At the moment, our chapters or branches are established in 40 cities with approximately 1,000 volunteers. So this is how I would like to describe the, the information ecosystem. We have the platforms, we have the government and related, we have the media and we have the consumers as the users or also commonly called the netizen. And Mafindo, we are thankful, we are grateful to be able to work with every member of the information ecosystem. Let's move on to the first member of the ecosystem, the platforms. Uh, with Google, we are working on various programs. You will see about some of them in upcoming slides again since this is just a highlight it is not possible for for me to uh, to share every program that we're working with the platforms with Meta on facebook and instagram as the ifc and certified organization mafindo is one of the 3pfc or the third party fact checker partner by the way ifcn is the international fact checker network with whatsapp uh, this is also quite common by other uh, fact checker organization. WhatsApp chatbot is currently quite popular because uh, in many countries, Indonesia would be one of, would be one of them. We are uh, providing the services through WhatsApp chatbot. And at the moment, this is the most, uh, the most popular platform. With TikTok starting from early this year, we are working on several programs. Some of them is the uh, safety workshop trainings, the training of introduction to disinformation for content creators, FGD sessions, the focus dis group discussion, expert roundtable, uh, NG NGO day event, etc. With the government, this is the next member of the information ecosystem. Uh, during the pan or infodemic, we are working not just with Indonesian COVID-19 Task Force, but also with WHO, UNESCO, UNICEF, and CDC. And not only on fact-checking, we are also working on some backstage unseen by the public, quote-unquote, meaning the work is not displayed, is not shared in our, our social media accounts. Uh, the activities such as the misinformation inoculation training and providing SML or the social media listening data. Uh, the next member of the ecosystem is the media. Uh, Checkfacta.com is quite a unique platform. This is a collabor collaboration platform where Mafindo works with more than 20 Indonesia's national media supported by AMSI. It is the Indonesian Cyber Media Association. 
and also with IG Indonesia, uh, Independent Journalist Alliance of Indonesia, and also with the GNI, Google News Initiative. Uh, on daily basis, we are sharing resources, uh, we are coordinating, we are sharing fact-check articles, and also runs other activities such as fact-checking trainings for journalists and fact-checkers, and also digital literacy and fact-checking trainings for the general public. Um, the last member, but not least, uh, of the information ecosystem, the consumers, working with CSO, NGO, or, or community as the representation of the public. Uh, Mahvindo is working with Cybercracy. This is Indonesia's national digital literacy movement where more than 100 organizations collaborating for digital literacy education. Also, we have a program called the media, uh, which is Media Empowerment for Democratic Integrity and Accountability. This is our program with USAID. We established the PESAT, it's the uh, Paguyuban Ecosystem Informasi Sehat or the Community of Healthy Information Ecosystem in several cities to harness the existing communities and local potential such as the leaders and influencers to gather them in a collaboration vessel. And not just with the representation, sorry, representations, uh, we are also directly working with the public on daily basis, which is the fact checking or the debunking. Professional fact checker team, uh, these are the full timers working with community fact checkers for on the crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing aspect. Their work is stored in a central database. We have a turn back ID site, which is, uh, it, it is open, it is uh, accessible by the public through uh, secure HTTP, meaning you can browse it using browser. Also, it's available in RSS feed. And also, you can ask for us with the API key. Uh, usually, this is related with, uh, you know, webmaster or uh, website owner. Uh, and from turnbackos.id, we publish it uh, through Mavindo social media accounts. We have Twitter, now it's called X. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have TikTok, and also other social media accounts. Not only that, we are working with National Radio's weekly program. Uh, some radio, some of them also have the podcast. So podcast is something that you can uh, play back many, many times. It depends on when you want to listen to it. And also we built an application called the HPT or the Hoaxbuster, Hoaxbuster Tools apps. And also again, we have a chatbot, WhatsApp chatbot. Uh, and not just on debunking, uh, this is at the moment uh, has become a trend, it's called pre-banking. Pre-banking is a preventive way to empower by inoculating against misinformation. So it's kind of like debunking the misinformation before the misinformation actually appears. Pre-banking is proactive and the banking is reactive. So pre-banking is actually something that uh, able to prevent uh, misinformation. So with checkfacta.com, again, this is consists of AG Indonesia, AMC, Google News Initiative, and Mavindo. We provide pre-banking training in several cities. This time is for the purpose of preparation of the general election next year, because usually mis misinformation are after, often tightly related to uh, the disturbance to elections, political, uh, political events. So one thing that most likely you already know is that ecosystem, the member of the ecosystem depends and influence each other, which means there are no single cause of the current condition of the media ecosystem. So there is no single cause, everyone contribute and depends on each other. So please do keep in mind something that most likely you already know, because in the previous sessions, we are also being reminded that governments, private sectors, technology sectors, private company, and everyone in uh, CSO and uh, other uh, movement is to collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Um, <laughs> yes, now, um, fact check organization, uh, including my uh, Japan Fact Check Center, uh, we are working not only for fact checks, but, only, but also for media literacy education, and we need collaboration. Uh, Mafindo is a great example. I, I learned a lot from Mafindo when I started Japan Fact Check Center. Thank you. So. Um, Next, uh, Chai, next please. Yes, hello. Um, let me share my slides for a moment.
Um, I'd like to introduce myself briefly. I'm Chai Hofilenia. I'm the investigative editor of Rappler. I also handle training and um, I'd like to share with you, and I'm also one of the founders of Rappler, um, along with three other women, when we started the uh, Rappler about 10, 11 years ago. I'd like to share with you the, the journey of Rappler um, in the fight against disinformation. So Rappler started on Facebook in 2011, and, but we created our own website in 2012. When, when we started out, we identified three important pillars of, of the organization. One is journalism, the second is community, and the third is tech and data. We believe then, as we do now, that journalism needs a community to thrive, most especially now when the trust levels for, for journalists and journalism as a profession as a whole has, has dropped tremendously and dangerously. Rappler journalists, we've, we've told them, we've told our young reporters that they need to be comfortable with technology and data if they want to be at the head of the game and they want to do cutting edge journalism. So by mutually supporting and reinforcing each other, um, Rappler uh, journalists working with community and using technology and data, uh, we hope to be able to build stronger and better communities of action that can bring about change. Um, this is after all the essence of journalism. So we are purely online and we turned 11 only last January. We've been recognized for investigative and data, those data stories that we do. And we're also a verified signatory of the IFCN Code of Principles. And we are one of two fact check partners of Meta or Facebook here in the Philippines, the other one being Verifiles. We also have remained independent despite the partnership with, with Meta, and we've done investigations on the platforms since 2016. And for accountability purposes, we have adopted a corrections policy since 2012. Let me tell you about um, what we've tried to build this past few years. Um, this did not happen instantaneously. This is, as, even as I speak, we continue to, to build and to, and to create and to expand this, this network. So what we've created is what we call Facts First PH. Um, it's really a community built around fact-checking and facts-based reporting. There are different layers, as you can see in the pyramid. The first layer is fact-checking, the second layer is mesh, the third layer is research, and the fourth layer is accountability. So essentially, it's media, civil society, academe, and even lawyers. As Maria Reza said in her Nobel speech, without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without trust, we have no shared reality and no democracy. So it's really anchored on truth-telling and, and democracy. So you will see at the, um, at the very base of the pyramid is, is fact-checking. Uh, what, what we've done here is we've brought together different newsrooms and journalist groups, not only in Metro Manila, but even in the provinces. And we've also brought in, um, we've worked with volunteers to help us in the fact-checking effort. Um, to, to expand this network, we've also done webinars online. We've found that it's more efficient and we're able to reach more students, teachers, and professionals when we do the, the fact check webinars. And once they graduate, they, uh, those, who, those who go through the webinars, the fact checking webinars, many of them become volunteers, although different um, varying degrees of, of activity. Um, but beyond the newsrooms, we've also expanded the, the group, the, the effort. So we've tapped um, NGOs, business and faith groups that help spread awareness about disinformation and disinformation operations. Uh, this, 
as I, as I said earlier, this is still work in, in progress. Universities, are, we've also brought in universities and, and researchers because after all, they've um, people from professors and researchers from academe are also interested in, in this information, except that they have difficulty popularizing their, their research. So we've teamed up with some universities and we've published their, uh, we've popularized what we say we call storified their researches and published them on our website. And finally, we, we also have pulled in lawyers and other legal groups. Um, they help journalists who have been attacked, who have been trolled and threatened online. Um, Filipino journalists, most especially under the Duterte administration, they were accused, they have been accused of being communist. So the, the term that we use there is red tagging. So that's very, very common. Um, so lawyers have, um, have come to the defense of, of some of these journalists because they believe that journalism must survive if democracy in the Philippines must survive. Um, so fa Facts First PH in general is really a multi-sectoral approach to fighting the infodemic. The appeal of, of this community is to fight the lies that weaken institutions and ultimately democracy. We also have a very, very young population. Um, the, the audience, the Rappler audience is very diverse, but majority of our readers come from the 18 to 24 age group, extending a bit to the um, 24 to 34 age brackets. We have felt the need to go beyond text. Text just does not work anymore, especially for a population that has a very, very short attention span. The, the younger generation, don't read, they don't read long form. They are attracted to video. They like, um, they like things that are very, very visual. So we've, we've adapted to that, we've adjusted, and we've used visuals like cartoons, um, as, as you can see on this slide. Uh, these were cartoons that were, that were shared, that were created and shared um, during the campaign period um, preceding the 2022 presidential elections. We, the, the hope here was that uh, we would make fact-checking a little more interesting and engaging. So the cartoonists and the comics creators became very, very active during the campaign period. Um, whether or not they were successful is another question altogether because we know who won the presidential elections in this country. We also tapped what we call influencers online. Um, we wanted to go beyond our usual echo chambers. What was important in, um, in working with select influencers is that uh, there was supposed to be a shared value uh, for truth telling and um, certain principles that they, they, that they also shared. So the objective is to go beyond the echo chambers and to reach communities that these influencers have access to. So through them, we were hoping to reach um, new audiences. So they cut across age groups from the young to the more seniors, uh, senior uh, readers and, and followers. And um, these influencers have established a degree of credibility also among the youthful and even the more mature audiences. And we we invited them to, to be part of, of the community and they obliged. Um, we also found that TikTok, um, as, as was shared earlier, has become an exponentially popular platform where we need to be to reach a more diverse audience. The messages essentially have focused on debunking falsehoods and providing useful information. So we turned to TikTok. Um, we, we realized that fighting this information is not just reacting to, to lies and that, that are being spread online, but it also means having to condense, to explain, to summarize, and to popularize very, very complex issues. Not very easy to do um, because how can you explain 
a very complex issue in one minute or 30 seconds or one minute and 30 seconds. It's, it's really, really very, very challenging. But we've, we've been forced to adapt and to, um, to adjust to, to our audience and, and our readers and to use the platform. I will admit that uh, initially at the start, we were very, very hesitant to use TikTok because of privacy and, and data concerns. But our audience has shifted there. And, uh, we, and we, we know that um, just like in Meta, we are, we are also very dependent on TikTok's algorithm. Um, but it's, it's a difficult choice. We, we said, we, we decided that we cannot not be on TikTok. So today, our young researchers and reporters alike, and the more senior um, Rappler journalists, also use the platform to explain issues such as uh, the fact-checking process, which you see on the left. Um, in the middle, um, one of our researchers tried to explain the use of, or rather the misuse of confidential funds in the budget. And this was, um, this was, this was in reference to Vice President Sara Duterte. And on the third, we also tried to um, explain the importance of making audit reports very transparent. So far, the, the feedback has been quite positive and the, the views have just been tremendous. So maybe, uh, you know, we, we just have to balance things, but so far, so good. Finally, uh, we've also tapped legal groups and, and lawyers. And we have, as, as I mentioned earlier, these lawyers are concerned about journalists, um, especially those who have been harassed and intimidated and been accused of being communists. Um, there's one particular group of lawyers very active uh, today. This is called, their, their group is called the Movement Against Disinformation. They helped file a case against Meta to compel it to disclose information about anonymous accounts that attack the editor-in-chief. Um, the editor-in-chief is the guy on the left, the, the, first, um, the first image there. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief of a provincial publication. So he said, uh, no, let me know who my anonymous attackers are. But of course, Meta has, has refused to, to disclose the information, but at least the, the effort is there, and we will see where, uh, where it will go. Another case involves um, a former government official and her co-host um, who had defamed another journalist and accused him also of being a communist. So this is the fad nowadays. You're a communist if you criticize government. So what he did was he filed a civil case, and um, take note, it, it was not a criminal case, but a civil case for damages because he does not believe in criminalizing libel. Um, this is essentially part of the pushback against the spread of disinformation and the aggressive attempt to further weaken the rule of law and suppress democratic discourse. We're, um, this is, it's work in progress and we hope that um, the community continues to grow. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Yeah, this is another great case of correlation, facts, facts first PH, working with journalists, civil society, academia, lawyers, and other professionals. And especially, it is essential to work with influencers on social media like TikTok to reach out to young people who are vulnerable to this information. Okay, um, Madi, next, please. Thank you so much, Dice Gaskalan, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. I'm just going to share my screen. Can I get a thumbs up if that has worked? Yes, fantastic. Okay. So today, um, I'm going to just provide a very brief overview about Microsoft's existing efforts to combat disinformation. Um, and it's really heartening to hear about the fantastic work of organizations like Mifindo and Rapla, um, because our view really is centered on the fact that, um, that, sorry, can you, sorry, can you still see my screen there? No, okay, sorry, let me. <laughs> 
um, go back, apologies. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, Okay, so absolutely Microsoft believes that the private sector has a responsibility to proactively and constructively engage in um, supporting democratic institutions and democracies around the world. And, and the, the importance of a collaborative approach has been alluded to already. So we will just build on that in, um, in our overview. So on the screen are the five principles that really guide our work when it comes to preventing disinformation um, and they illustrate our role as to where we think the private sector can add value in addition to the important work that civil society organizations and government are already doing in this space. Um, we think it's absolutely crucial to be leveraging technology to help democratic institutions because quite often it is technology that is causing some of the challenges in the first place. Um, we want to play a leadership role in industry and, and make sure that other companies and other parts of the private sector are also doing their part. We think it's very important to develop strategic partnerships that do cut across sectors, including partnerships with civil society and government. Of course, be nonpartisan in our efforts and, and always be working to support democracies around the world. Um, so all of our efforts when it comes to disinformation at Microsoft uh, come out of what we call the Democracy Forward Initiative. And this initiative works to preserve, protect and advance the fundamentals of democracy by promoting a healthy information ecosystem, by safeguarding open and secure democratic processes, and by advocating for corporate civic responsibility, both from ourselves and from other companies in this space. I think we all acknowledge very strongly that disinformation erodes trust in the information that we rely on to, to keep us alive often. Um, and unfortunately, the local news outlets that many of us previously turned to are disappearing. And so Microsoft and, and many other companies are dedicated to supporting a healthy information ecosystem where we can still access news that is trusted and, and information that is, um, is credible. In June 2022, Microsoft actually announced its pilot information integrity principles, which outline how we approach disinformation from foreign actors across our products and services. And just quickly, these four principles um, are freedom of expression, so really making sure that we uphold our customers' ability to create, publish, and search for information using our platforms. The importance of authoritative content, so we're always trying to prioritize the surfacing of content that will counter foreign cyber influence operations or disinformation campaigns. Demonetization, so we will never willfully profit from cyber influence content or disinformation actors. And then the fourth um, principle is proactive efforts. So we're always exploring opportunities to work more proactively to prevent our platforms and products from being used to amplify foreign cyber influence or disinformation campaigns. Um, so the Democracy Forward Initiative collaborates with teams all across Microsoft, um, but also external partners to increase societal resilience against disinformation and develop technical solutions and drive impactful thought leadership. So we do this under a number of different areas. The first one being societal resilience. And here we're really focused on the development of partnerships across industries to create whole of society approaches to, do, to, to address the challenge that is disinformation, which as we all know is really a whole of society problem. One example of a partnership here is our partnership with NewsGuard, which is a third party site that provides credibility ratings and detailed nutrition labels for thousands of news and information websites um, around the world. And these websites at the moment are quite concentrated um, in Europe and English speaking countries. And in fact, the websites account for 95% of online engagement across the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, and Italy. So there's, there's a lot of value in being able to provide what we call nutrition labels around the content that people are seeing in these countries. We are also, um, of course, signatories to the European Union's Code of Practice on Disinformation. And we've actually just published our report for the first half of 2023. 
Um, the report notes that more than 6.7 million fake accounts were blocked on LinkedIn um, or prevented from being created in the first place in the first half of 2023. Um, and that Bing search promoted authoritative information or downgraded less authoritative information in relation to almost 800,000 searches relating to the war in Ukraine. So they're just some examples of proactive efforts that we have leveraged on our own products and services. Um, another key area of our work in the information integrity space is really um, data integration and working with internal and external stakeholders to detect and learn from disinformation campaigns and leverage these findings to develop new solutions to help take these actors offline. Um, we're consistently conducting research and creating reports on threats and the attacks that Microsoft and our Digital Threat Analysis Center have taken action against. And we're increasingly looking at the intersection between cyber attacks um, or security breaches and information influence operations. And I think it's fair to say that the, the traditional techniques used by um, information and, and cyber attacks are now being deployed by those running information security, um, information influence operations and targeted disinformation campaigns as well. And then finally, um, technical solutions are a really important part of the information integrity approach. Microsoft is actually a founding member of the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, the C2PA, alongside other companies such as Adobe, Intel, Twitter, the BBC, and, and many other companies. Um, earlier this year, the coalition actually launched its first version of an open source content provenance tool, which allows creators to claim authorship while empowering consumers to make informed decisions about what kind of digital media they should trust. And we think this is really important as more and more of us are using generative AI, there needs to be a lot of transparency around what content has been generated by AI, so consumers have that knowledge. Um, another really important aspect of our work is around information literacy, and um, our goal here is really to build trust in the information ecosystem by enhancing the skills that consumers have when it comes to um, media literacy and also just consuming information. We see this part of our work as helping to address what we call the demand side of disinformation. So obviously there's lots of work we're doing on the supply side to try and you know target the, the campaigns and gain intel. But on the demand side, we really need to be building resilience in the population to be able to actually intake information in a critical manner. And that's an, in addition to the, the great work that other civil society organizations do. Here we have a, a multi-layered approach and that includes um, partnering with relation, um, lots of different organizations to embed information literacy campaigns and concepts into products and training around the world. Um, utilizing our own platforms to help educate consumers on how to find and consume trusted information in a correct way and also sourcing, developing and sharing best practices based on industry research, both internally across our company, but also with external partners across the information space. Um, a couple of quick examples of how we've done this is by providing in-client advertising space across various platforms that we have, including Microsoft Star and Outlook to organizations that promote information literacy resources and skills. Um, in the program's first 12 months, we actually reached over 130 million Microsoft consumers with um, information literacy resources and skill campaigns. Um, and in 2023, a little bit later this year, we're very excited to be launching a Minecraft education information, information literacy game. Um, along with accompanying educator materials, which we know will be very popular amongst younger children, starting to give them the, the skills and, and resilience they need to be critical consumers of information. So I will leave it there and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Maddie. Yeah.
as Madi said, uh, technical solutions are very important. This information spreaders are using AI. So, and so we need AI and other technologies to prevent it. And performers are the best at these things. Okay, um, next scene, please. Thank you, Furuta-san. Hello, everyone. I'm Shinichi Yamaguchi. Today, I'd like to talk about misinformation and disinformation in our society. I'm sorry, but uh, I'd like to speak in Japanese, so could you please use this one? Thank you. First of all, I'll introduce myself first. I'm working at Glowcom, which is a research university in the United States. At that university, I'm working on social science. 私は経済学博士でして、特に専門は軽量経済学というデータ分析手法です。私はその手法を使って、ソーシャルメディア上の偽情報、誤情報、ネットいじめといった諸課題や、情報社会の新しいビジネスモデルについての実証研究をしています。で今日のイベントに関わるところで言いますと日本政府の総務省と長い間共同研究とかあるいはメディア情報リテラシー教育教材を作るなどで連携をしておりますで今日皆さんにご紹介したいのは私が Google Japan と共に行っているイノベーション日本というプロジェクトの研究成果ですで2015年からこちらの研究プロジェクトをやっておりますが2019年から偽情報誤情報をテーマに実証研究をしておりますで毎年1万人を超える人を対象としたアンケート調査データから人々の行動を分析していますで今日ご紹介しますのはその中でも特に2022年と2023年に発表した最新の研究成果ですでここではコロナワクチンと政治に関連する偽情報誤情報を6個ずつそして陰謀論を6個合計18個の実際の情報を使って人々の行動を分析しましたその結果まず分かったのが政治的な誤情報偽情報に出会った後にその情報が誤っていると気づいている人それがたった 13% しかいないということですでコロナワクチンや陰謀論についてはこの割合が増加しますがそれでも 40% 強ということで偽情報誤情報を読んだ後気づいていない人つまり騙されている人が大半いるということが分かりましたでさらに50代や60代の人の方がこのような偽情報誤情報を信じやすいという傾向も見られましてこの問題が若い人だけの問題ではないということも分かりましたこのような偽情報誤情報読んだ後に拡散している人というのがだいたい15から 35% 存在していますで興味深かったのがその拡散手段で最も多かったのが直接の会話であったという点ですつまりこの偽情報誤情報というのはインターネットを超えて社会全体の情報生態系の問題であるということが言えますこのような人々の拡散行動について右下のような数学的なモデルを使って定量分析をしましたその結果分かったのが偽情報誤情報を信じている人は信じていない人に比べてはるかに高い確率でそれらの情報を拡散しているということですまたメディアリテラシーや情報リテラシーが低い人ほど偽情報誤情報を拡散するという傾向も見られましたつまり私たちが見ているこの情報環境というのは、えー、偽情報誤情報を信じている人やリテラシーの低い人が情報を積極的に拡散している空間であるということが言えますこのような偽情報誤情報が
社会にどのような影響を与えているかも調査しましたでその時は2つの実際の誤情報を使って誤情報を読む前と読んだ後で人々の考えがどのように変化するかを調査しました具体的には保守系の政治家に不利な誤情報とリベラル系の政治家に不利な誤情報この2つを使って2人の政治家への支持がどのように変化するかを見たのですその結果分かったのがまず少なくない数の人が偽情報誤情報を読んで意見を変えるつまり支持を下げる傾向にあるということですそしてそれだけではありません特に支持を下げていたのがやや支持するといったような弱い支持をしている人たちでした皆さんもご存知の通りこのような弱い支持層というのは人数でいうと非常に多くて選挙で大きな力を持っている人たちですそのような人たちが偽情報誤情報を読んで考えを変えやすいということはすなわち偽情報誤情報は選挙結果に大きな影響を与えている可能性があるということが分かりましたさらに昨今普及している生成 AI もこの問題を大きく拡大していくということが予想されますなぜならば誰もが自由に偽画像偽動画偽テキストを簡単に作れてそしてそれを広めることができる時代になったからですで一つ懸念しているのがこの AI によって作られた偽画像や偽映像はもはや人の目ではチェックしきれないということですですから AI が作ったものかどうか判断する技術の開発など技術開発によって、えー偽,偽情報誤情報問題に対抗するということが重要であると考えておりますさてここから私たちの組織がどのようなことをやっているか簡単にご紹介します先ほどからご説明しているような実証研究を IT 企業とやったりまた日本政府とやったりしてでさらにそこから得られた成果をさまざまなステークホルダーに共有するという活動をしていますそれだけではなくて例えば一番左のように日本政府と偽情報誤情報への接し方そうです、ね、偽情報誤情報に関する教育教材といったものを作成したりまた真ん中のように YouTube クリエイターとコラボレーションして偽情報誤情報に関する啓発動画を作るキャンペーンをしたりまた一番右のように大きなイベントを開いてさまざまなステークホルダーが議論しその成果を皆さんにお伝えすることをしておりますで我が国では他にもさまざまな活動が行われていまして例えば多様なステークホルダーが集って議論する委員会が立ち上がったりあるいは古田さんも編集長をしていますが日本ファクトチェックセンターのようなファクトチェック組織が立ち上がり IFCN 加盟団体となりましたでしかしながら未来に向けてまだまだできることはあるというふうに考えておりますまずはじめに透明性の確保が非常に重要ですそれもグローバルなものだけでなくて日本ローカル、まあ、各国ローカルの透明性の確保ということが求められると思います2つ目にメディア情報リテラシー教育の拡充3つ目にテクノロジーでこの問題に対抗するための技術開発4つ目に偽情報誤情報を作成している人に広告費などで多額の収入が入らないようにする仕組みの,仕組みの構築5つ目にファクトチェックを効率的に実施し効率的に届ける方法の検討そして6つ目にいろいろなステークホルダーが協力するということそして何より国際的な協力をするということだと考えておりますそのベースに今回総務省から発表されたいいパッドがなるのかなというふうに期待しております以上ですご清聴ありがとうございましたでは、Thank you, Sin.、Uh, this data shows not only that literacy is important, but also what kind of literacy is useful and how.、Uh, international sharing of 
such data is very important to make uh, measures more effective. So, uh, okay, now we only have seven minutes for discussion. So I have a lot of questions, each of you, but um, I think I can have uh, only one question to you all. Um, okay, so my question to you all is, uh, so what is needed to deepen international cooperation, not, not only in inside that your country, but also the globally? So... Any opinions would be greatly appreciated. So, how about you? Are we do you want to start? Yeah. So, uh, previously, Maria Reza in the previous session said that it's time to start. So, uh, I think after this uh, this good event, such a important event, uh, like what Maria said, uh, let's do some concrete steps to so we can actually start on uh, handling uh, disinformation and misinformation. Earlier I chat uh, that basically everyone is in the same boat. So uh, disinformation and misinformation, no matter in what country, basically is the same. It's just more like local context. So uh, I think uh, it is a good start. This is a good occasion for the, the internet to start on the any type of uh, collaboration on, on uh, handling this misinformation by by the member of the OK system that I previously presented. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, now, yeah, we uh, yeah, sometimes yeah, exchange our the knowledge to for fact-checking inside uh, Asian organizations. So, so what do you think, uh, Chai? Uh, how can we deepen our collaboration, cooperation? Globally. I think what's what's yeah what what's essential really is to strengthen journalists and newsrooms um, because that's what it's the journalists who who produce the information. Um, earlier, it was mentioned that you know there's pre-bunking, but so related to pre-bunking is really um, the ability um, making sure that journalists and newsrooms, not just in specific countries but in the region and even worldwide, have the, the tools and have the resources to be able to do the job that they need to do. And that includes um, investigations and being able to track um, players and actors, those who are part of the disinformation network. Um, doing this is very expensive and not all journalists have the skills uh, or, or are able to do it and not all newsrooms have the resources. Um, to be able to do these types of online um, investigations. So if, if there are people, if there are private groups, companies, or even IT companies who, who have the resources and can share that, can share those with, with journalists, that, that would go a very, very long way. We have to be able to do our jobs well. And if we're able to do our jobs well, then we can be able to proactively prevent the spread of disinformation. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have an additional question. Uh, independence is really important for journalists, new news organizations. So do you have any advice on how to deepen cooperation with other organizations while maintaining the independence? Uh, well, at least for uh, in Southeast Asian newsrooms and, and even Asia, uh, we've like Rappler has uh, has offered fellowships, for example, and this is also with the help of grants and funding. Um, this is upskilling of uh, of reporters and, and journalists, and we've we've found that um, this isn't just in the region, but even in in the Philippines, the skills of journalists are very very uneven. And um, if we're able to to work together and and share what we know best, especially with the advent of AI. AI is going to be a very, very serious threat to, um, to, to, to newsrooms. Um, we have to be prepared to be, to be able to deal with it. So the, the, um, the collaboration and the sharing, I don't know if this can be done through training or even exchanges, maybe uh, reporters can work in, in one newsroom um, for a specific period of time just to just to be immersed and to know 
what uh, what newsrooms are capable of doing, and then that the skills can be shared with with other colleagues that can probably help. Thank you, um, Madi. As Chai said, uh, AI and technology are essential. Um, but uh, the the many newsrooms are uh, lack of to hiring the engineers. Uh, they are not good at uh, using technology. So how the Microsoft and platformers can support the newsrooms or fact checkers with technology? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think it, it really does emphasize the importance of these kinds of conversations where we just have the opportunity to connect um, industry and, and civil society who have excellent ideas in this space, but perhaps lack the resources to make them scalable and, and take them to all corners of the world and to all sorts of different newsrooms. So I, I think these sorts of initiatives are a really important starting point to bring us all together. But then um, absolutely technology companies, we, you know, technology has disrupted the way that people get their news. So there is a, an obligation um, for some work to be done to kind of support newsrooms as they um, advance into the next chapter. And AI will be beneficial to many of them, but it will also present lots of new challenges. Um, and so those partnerships between technology companies and, and journalists are very important. And, and Microsoft has has lots of those, and we're always interested in um, identifying new journalist partners in other countries. So um, I, I welcome anyone to reach out to me after this panel today. Um, but I, I guess the other point is um, that that's all looking at sort of the supply side of the information and where the information is coming from. But I think another really important aspect for us is trying to tackle that demand side. So you know, particularly. Um, with young children and, and generations growing up with AI, making sure that they um, develop the digital resilience and information literacy skills that they will need to actually use this technology in their lives as they move forward in a responsible way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think yeah, many journalists and newsrooms are really interested in their working with platforms uh, for using the AI and technologies. Um, Thank you. Um, Sin Sang, um, so uh, the question for you is, uh, so from the researcher's point of view, so what is collaboration and measures uh, needed for our information ecosystem? So そうですね。あの、偽情報、誤情報の問題はやっぱりもう国内で閉じないということは間違いなく言えますし、あの海外での問題になっているものが、え、輸入されることもあるし、またその逆もあると。で、海外からの影響力工作の話も、え、今日少